Um, so with that, uh, I do want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Mary Means is a widely is is widely known for her, uh, leading the team that actually created the National Main Street Center um, and actually put the four points to work. Um, so she runs a small uh, but mighty planning firm that helped communities and other public interest organizations with uh, strategic plans that achieve strong public support. And she's been honored um, by the Planning Association, American Planning Association in 2018 for a Planning Pioneer Award. Also the National Trust for Historic Preservation with the 2020 Louis DuPont uh, Crown In Shield Award. That's the highest honor in historic preservation. And she's also the uh, namesake for the Mary Means Leadership Award that recognizes uh, and celebrates outstanding leaders across the Main Street American Network. And um, actually last year we um, nominated Brenda Ferry for that award, but uh, we appreciate Mary, you being with us and uh, wanna turn it over to you and welcome you. And um, we'd love to you know, hear what you uh, see as we start looking forward. Thank you, Daniel. I'm thrilled to, I was going to say I'm thrilled to be there. I rather that I was there with you in New Mexico, but uh, this is the second best that we can have for that. So I'm happy. Uh, I want to share my screen and let's see what's going to happen if I need to uh, try to let's see if we get this up. Uh, I don't know whether this, I had huge computer problems yesterday and this morning. So I want to make sure that I'm, and normally I'm not this goofy, but I think uh, we're going to share screen and I'm going to pull up something else. I'm trying to get to something on another screen. Hang on guys, sorry about this. All right, let's see if this works on the share screen thing. Thank you for your patience. Are you still there? We are still here. Okay. Well, I'm I don't just know. Gonna, I didn't have to share screen because uh, I would have, I was lost this morning myself. Yeah. Mary, I don't know if it's helpful, but we saw your presentation for just a, a moment. Okay, what I'm trying to do is get back the um, the Zoom share screen screen, which I don't seem to be. I'm also not using my own computer, which is a real handicap. Eh, come on. This Mary, did you, did you say you're... Yeah, if you if you move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, the share screen button should pop up. Even when I'm not on, um, even when I'm on the, I'm moving it down to the bottom and I'm not getting it. So it's, if you go back to Zoom yep. and then you hit share screen, um, and then I think when you shared your screen a moment ago, I think we saw your PowerPoint and you were trying to get to full screen mode maybe for that. So we can walk you through that too. All right, so I'm back to Zoom. And what do I have on Zoom? We'll take up half my time doing this. <laughs> That's okay. We've got a little break after your presentation. So we've got a little time built in. Okay, I tell you what, why don't I leave Zoom and come back in and I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, let me see if I can get back in this way. Okay, now let's see about share screen. And what I'm trying for. All right, I have a, I'm mean, gonna need you to help me for a second. I have, um, this done as uh, my presentation is done as a PDF that uh, was up a minute ago, and now mm -hmm. I need to find it. Cause 
what you saw. Let's see if this is going to work in PowerPoint. It's not. Um, I'm not going to go into the complications of my computer meltdown, but um, and this is very frustrating. Yeah, did you, can we just put it in the chat and then maybe um, Amy or somebody can open it up from our side? I don't even know that I can do that. I've got a half a partial functioning computer here. So maybe okay. what I ought to do is just talk to you guys and let you paint imaginary pictures in the air. Mm -hmm. um, I, that was my <laughs> that was my plan C this morning, but it might end up having to be plan B. So I'm going to take us out of shared screen and and get back to how do I how do I leave shared screen? We're gonna well, that. you're not you're not sharing your screen right now. Just okay, so, you know. so it's just me. All right. Well, <laughs> hi everybody. <laughs> Uh, this usually works very nicely, but last evening I was trying to install something else uh, and it seems to have fried uh, a good bit of my computer. So normally I'm not this computer goofy, but today I am. So it's, it's great to be with you in New Mexico, even if I'm not. Um, I wanted to go through um, in my remarks today because I, I suspect that many of you, whether you are a local Main Street manager or work with the state or, or one of the leaders in uh, a New Mexico Main Street town, you may not know how it all began because you might have gotten into this um, fairly recently, uh, like in the last few years. Uh, so I wanna take you back 40 years ago um, and sort of bring you forward with how we got to today. And beyond that is a little bit about some thoughts that um, will build on some of Matt's remarks this morning about uh, what we can expect going forward. But before I do that, I want to take my hat off to you. That's why the bedhead this morning. I want to take my hat off to all of you out there who are working because I cannot imagine what it has been like for each of you uh, during this last year. Uh, you didn't sign on to do what you've been having to do um, because I'm gathering from everything I've heard that you are not only doing a fine job with your Main Street four point um, responsibilities, but you're also having to be there for an awful lot of people who are in stages of distress and, um, and stress and loss and everything else so that your job never ends. It's kind of like 24 seven. And I just wanted you to know, thank you for all you're doing. So let's go back to 40 years ago. Maybe that will help. It was bad then, but not as bad as right now, at any rate. 40 years ago, um, my job, I, I got hired by the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, in the early 1970s to go to the Midwest um, and deliver preservation field services to a 10 state Midwestern region. Um, I was supposed to be out there kind of building, helping build preservation organizations and getting advocates on board. Um, and one of the things I found as I was traveling around the Midwest, there were just two of us in this small office, there weren't preservation organizations really then. And the emphasis had been on single landmark kind of buildings. That's what preservation was thought to be. But as I was traveling around the Midwest, yeah, there were some really wonderful examples of fine architecture. But the thing that seemed to be everywhere and just seemed to be more at risk because it was so taken for granted were these wonderful small downtowns. The scale of them, the quality of some of the architecture in them and the potential for them. Um, and they were like all over the place but they didn't seem to really think they were historic. These are just old buildings. So um, at the same time, there was a tremendous move that was dragging things, pulling things out from downtown. Shopping centers were beginning to come on the scene and they weren't just in big cities, they were beginning to come out and, and take business away from smaller communities as well. And some of the better businesses, of course, were moving to the shopping center. So uh, the towns were slowly dying. And if leaders in the town wanted to do something about it, they needed information about other, how, how other towns had done it. But here's the kicker. And I know it's hard to believe, but there was a time before the internet, before the Google came along. So if you were sitting in your town and you were watching it die and it was becoming half vacant, you were going, how do we fix this? What do we do? 
uh, there wasn't any, you couldn't just Google, say, help, help me save my town. So they needed examples and they needed information. So one of the places they were getting examples was Disney World, believe it or not, opened in the early 1970s. And from the Midwest, a lot of people went to Florida to Disney World and they would see the Main Street component of it there. Any of you have seen it or been to Disney World know they have a really oomph Main Street, uh, it's bright. So they would come home and they would look around and they would see their own town differently. It's like, oh, remember that Main Street? This looks a lot like it, except, you know, well, maybe if we did some paint up and fix up and clean up of some of these buildings, we could return some of the vitality there. So that was at one end of the spectrum of, of what can we do about our downtown. The other end of that spectrum was let's just tear it all down and start all over. And there were federal programs with um, urban renewal clearance funds that were intended for bigger cities, but they made it possible for a number of small communities to do this. If we had the slides up, I would be showing you Winooski, Vermont, which tore down an entire two blocks of one side of their main street, thinking that a shopping center might land there, they might recruit something there, and it stayed vacant in the middle of the downtown for 30 years. Uh, you can't imagine what that does in terms of the town's confidence in its ability to do anything right. And certainly you can imagine what it does to the vitality of a town and half of the downtown disappears. Sort of in the middle of the spectrum of what do we do about our fading downtown? Um, I, I refer to it as slip covers. It was, let's make our buildings look more like modern and look more like the shopping center. So there were manufacturers of sort of plastic and aluminum um, materials that you could wrap a building in and, and have it kind of lose that old fashioned uh, look. Um, but underneath it, in most cases, the older building was there. Now, this meant though that the idea that you might want to make something of these older buildings and about preservation, um, again, it was just like, that's something for Charleston or Boston, but here in Indiana, we're not historic. And here in, in Kansas, we're not either. Um, so there are only two of us in the Midwest office with 10 states. So we weren't going to make any headway against all of this if we weren't able to address what I'd say were two related issues, related problems. The first of which is easy to, <coughs> to imagine. It's the town centers, the main streets were being left behind as kind of relics or, or uh, they were being demolished. There was quite a lot of demolition taking place. So if we were gonna make preservation work, there were too many of these and it, you couldn't sort of take a typical preservation perspective on a building by building perfection mode. We had to find ways for communities to save them and to bring their main streets back to life. Now, second and really directly related to this is the issue of um, leadership. Um, the advocates for preservation in the 70s tended to be, they were really passionate um, and dedicated, but they were really lacking in power. Um, and the, those who had the power, who held power, were at best skeptical about preservation. Uh, they viewed us and all of us in preservation as kind of seeing the world through curatorial eyes, uh, seeking architectural perfection, and everybody knows that's really expensive. So what we needed to do in, with these two issues of saving our downtowns and getting the a power structure behind it was we needed to be able to make believers out of those in power while helping the ones who were trying to stop things from being torn down. And the best way to make believers was to be able to make preservation um, matter to them, to make them see that it had value for them. So who was in power? I was gonna say business people. I'm gonna flat out right now and say in the 70s, it was business men. Um, and where were they? They were in the downtowns. They still hadn't moved out to the shopping center. So if we could make preservation work downtown, maybe we could address both of these overarching issues. So I'm not kidding when I say we were the naivete of youth. Um, I was in my late twenties and we just decided we were gonna set out to do this. We were gonna produce information that communities could use and be helpful. But information about what? We had no idea how do you make preservation and economic development um, work hand in glove 
in smaller communities or anywhere for that matter. Um, but never mind that, we were in our 20s. So you say, we can do that. We will work in three towns um, and we'll learn over the course of three years what works and what doesn't. And then we'd hold conferences, we would write a book, we'd make a film, uh, and we do all of it in three years. And we would document it along the way. Uh, we would collect um, fairly easily collected data points so that we would be able to say that this had made an impact uh, economically. If we could answer that question that I was always being asked when I was speaking, which is if I invest in doing this, what's gonna do to my bottom line? And I knew we had to have an answer for that. So the, the National Endowment for the Arts uh, gave us a, a, a kickoff grant for it. Uh, a major manufacturer of building materials came on board right away and said, we'll pay for the whole thing. Um, uh, there's a story behind that later, but that's later. So we competitively chose three towns in the Midwest, about 70 um, applied. And we were looking for a range of issues that would be kind of what, so among the three, we wanted most of the issues that smaller communities were dealing with to be present in our, in our little laboratories. Um, so the three towns were um, Hot Springs, South Dakota, which is about 5,000 people. And it had been a tourist community around the medicinal value of the hot springs in the Black Hills. Galesburg, Illinois, uh, the home of Carl Sandburg, uh, was about 50,000 population and it was a big railroad hub. Uh, two major lines crossed there, uh, it still is. Um, and the third town, Madison, Indiana, was on the Ohio River and it was like this beautiful little 19th century market town. Um, it was kind of a gem, but there were lots of those slip covers and things like that. One of the beauties about Galesburg, and from our perspective, and naturally, the Carl Sandburg, the Sandburg Mall had just opened just outside of Galesburg when we they were selected. So already they were losing a lot of key businesses downtown. So one of the main things we did was we put a trust, a National Trust staff member in each of those three towns for three years. And they knew their job was not just to help get something going there and help get this documentation going, but it was to also be wearing the hat that says, I'm working here locally with the townsfolk, but I'm also very much in touch with my colleagues at the Chicago office and in the other towns, because we are doing this to be able to learn from it. So it was a very different kind of shape-shifting perspective they had to have. So we did learn a lot over the course of three years. And we learned so much that we covered a couple of walls with newsprint as we would get together periodically to try to figure it out. And we did our best to distill it and distill it and distill it down to something that people could understand and people could get behind and find useful. And that's where the, what you know today is the four point approach came up is we looked at it and said, what seems to be working could be put into four buckets. Uh, and those are organization, promotion, design, and what we called economic restructuring at the time. Um, and in the course of all that, I think something that's been lost a little bit is we had decided that those four buckets were all essential to working on the image, the overall image of the town. Now, I don't think that's just about design and appearance. At the time, and I think this continues to be the case, it's also about the town's self image, its own sense of whether it's healthy, whether it can has any kind of being in charge of its own fate or whether it's just left to be battered. Because that self image is what lets you get up in the morning and lets you set to work. So we learned that working in all four of these areas together was necessary for people to be able to do this. And the key ingredient, and all of you who are Main Street um, local managers will appreciate this, we really discovered that the key ingredient in all of it was to have a dedicated person who, who their job was 24 seven, you're not gonna like the 24 seven part, but they woke up each morning saying, my job is to do something to get our, our Main Street going and keep it, keep it lively, to orchestrate the volunteers. So we learned the power then of story and vision. Um, the common wisdom at the time we were doing this, all over the country, the, the whole thing was move to the suburbs, move out from downtown, it's dead. 
And it's been said recently that when the Main Street program came along, we came along with a different narrative, an alternative narrative, one that said, hey, wait a minute, you don't have to leave. It's the heart of your town. It's the heart of your community. And you can actually do some things about it. Um, and here's how. So we were supposed to go away and disappear at the end of three years, go on to something else, but we somehow managed to kind of keep it together. And one of the reasons that we were able to do that is from the very beginning, from day one, when we announced we we're gonna work with three towns, the, me the media absolutely loved it. This was in the days of newspapers and hundreds of newspapers carried articles about it across the country. It was David and Goliath. After all, we were battling the shopping center. All three at the time, there were only three broadcast television networks did features on it. And it was just people started calling the National Trust. They'd never seen anything like it. The response to it was phenomenal. Um, and it really began to, began to gain traction that was far beyond the Midwest. So we decided that instead of rolling off into the sunset at the end of three years, uh, we would try to take it to another level. And with that, we uh, worked with six states, each of them with five towns, because we figured if we could get states to serve as platforms for Main Street revitalization programs, that it would stand a good chance of, of moving ahead and staying in place even though the National Trust for Historic Preservation might not be in the Main Street game very long. So that's how it all happened, that it became states with networks of local communities. And here it is 40 something years later, and it's all still going. Um, now, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of years um, I, about this, because I had kind of moved away from the world of Main Street in the mid 1980s. I began a, a, a practice, a planning practice that worked with communities at all scales on a whole variety of things, but they generally had to do with helping communities find that sense of vision, that image they wanted to uh, work towards, and then be able to implement and move ahead with, with uh, navigating the change. So it, we had a good ride with that. But as I went two years ago to the awards luncheon at the American Planning Association, and it was very nice. And I, I looked up at the screen where they were giving me my award. And up on the screen were the numbers of what had happened in that 40 years. 40 states, 1,600 communities, 300,000 buildings renovated, 150,000 net new businesses, 672,000 net new jobs, and 85 billion in reinvestment in communities. It wasn't a very good thing to do, but on my way up to get the award, my jaw just hit the floor. I had no idea that Main Street, the little thing from three towns, had grown into such a powerful network. Um, it's been called, Ed McMahon at the Urban Land Institute has said, dollar for dollar, pound for pound, Main Street is one of the most effective economic development programs ever created. And as I look at that, I thought, no wonder they're giving me this award. I had no idea we'd done this. So there, there you go for a bit of humility. But the story of this that those numbers represent has kind of flown under the radar of Main Street econ or mainstream economists and preservationists. So that's when I decided that I needed to really write a book about it. Um, and I think you probably have heard that um, it's out. It was originally going to be called Main Street's Comeback. Um, and as I was beginning to finish it, um, the pandemic landed. So I changed the title and rewrote half of it because the story that had been going to end on a great a victory mountain, all of a sudden it was very different. And the book is now called Main Street's Comeback and how it can come back again. Um, and it came out about two months ago. Um, the damage of the pandemic is profound. You know that, uh, everybody knows that. Well, most everybody. Um, beyond the, the tragic uh, loss of life and the grief of families who have lost people, uh, it's really an existential crisis. Uh, I loved Matt's referring to it as a great accelerator. It's just that it also accelerated things on the downslide too. Um, but nowhere has it been more of an impact than on the nation's main streets. And, and you well know that. But 
I have to say, <clears throat> I'm, it took me a while in the last spring to kind of get out of my shock and depression to recognize and get around and talk with a lot of you and realize that Main Streets, most Main Streets have weathered existential crises before. Um, they weathered uh, the Great Depression when there were bread lines that literally went around the block for pe or people trying to get the three jobs that might be available. And they were passing boarded up stores everywhere. And then if you think about the flight to the suburbs, suburbs and how the shopping centers were gonna kill it off, Main Street's even survived so far, um, the Great Amazon. Um, and now there are more than 1,600 of these communities, the communities you're in, that have ac active Main Street organizations. None of that existed 40 years ago. And that town that, and, and you also have the internet, which is connecting everybody, and you have the National Main Street Center. So it was just amazing to see how quickly <clears throat> many, and if not most, Main Street communities have been able to pivot and start helping their small businesses uh, and each other working across uh, uh, lines and working across states. Um, and that's been just an amazing thing to see for the last several months. Um, I think the Main Street organizations have really been there for their communities to be an advocate for changing the policies and practices that small businesses need to operate outdoors. That was one of the first quick things that were done. And some of these changes, the, the outdoors part, in particular, the place part of it, have been so popular and well-received that some communities are moving to make them permanent. I lived in Old Town Alexandria, Virginia for many years. And the idea, the neighbors, the, pe the people who lived in, near the downtown were right next to it. So every time something was proposed like outdoor dining, the neighbors, the NIMBYs would start yelling about it was gonna be very noisy. And the idea that Alexandria, Virginia would almost overnight be able to institute stuff that's made it just a much more exciting place to live um, was unheard of. So a great accelerator is quite right. Um, and I don't know what we would have done without the organized uh, efforts to do this. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong and think that I'm just being a Pollyanna about this. Uh, I know that a lot of small businesses have just not been able to make it and that some of the losses have just been heartbreaking. Uh, particularly some of those businesses are second, third, fourth generation, and they've become kind of local living landmarks for communities. That's really heartbreaking. But it's also good to note, as Matt said, that the rise of entrepreneurship has really uh, been out there. So I'm confident that they're gonna be returns to a lot of these communities. They'll just be, uh, the vacancies will have new occupants. Um, now, there's also hope with these vacancies because I look at it and say thousands upon thousands of volunteers, not just those of you who are the wake up every morning and it's Main Street, but all these volunteers who've turned their downtowns around over the course of the last 40 years are just not going to stand by and let them die. So I'm I'm hopeful about that. There's also some a lot of new information that's come out from the Main Street Center, from the, uh, that's Main Street America, I keep calling it by its old name, um, and also from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Kennedy Smith has done a wonderful publication on that has 26, 28 different ideas for now, for a little farther, and then looking ahead to the future of things that can really help smaller communities uh, return to good health. So I'm gonna wrap up shortly, but um, I look at it and say 40 years ago, this tiny band of naive but determined preservationists set out to uh, find a way for Main Street's historic buildings to get, earn their keep. That's what we were trying to do. We had no idea that it would lead to this powerful vehicle for economic recovery uh, after COVID. No one could have predicted that. But I've come to see that it, we're, we're up on the screen now would be a map of the United States with about a million dots on it. And all of those are Main Street towns. So together, these 1,600 towns in 40 states, think about it. You are part of an invisible system for recovery. 
Uh, and it's really time to lift it up and make that visible. And that's part of what this book was all about, was to bring it to the attention of those who are engaged in recovery um, uh, approaches and economics of it, so that they understand that what this is, is a resilient network for regeneration. Regeneration is a term that Bruce Katz at the Urban, um, at, rather at, at the Brookings Institute was using about organizations that are there at the local level who can help rebuild, who can help it all come back. And they tend to be place-based uh, and there's no question that Main Street organizations are right at the center of that. And why are they important? Well, at first you remember that we were, the feds were shipping money into Rightly so, PPP was there for individual businesses. There were programs that were available for individual businesses. But you know from your work that if there's a successful business in one building and three or four vacancies in the blocks around them, then it's not going to work very well and the whole downtown is not going to progress forward. So Main Street organizations as regenerators are there and able to work with the whole to bring the place and to bring work with landlords and building owners uh, and entrepreneurs uh, to bring a lot of this back. Um, because we know that the recovery of um, these small businesses is actually really dependent on the recovery of whole places. That's one of the reasons that it's so important to keep you going well, um, and also to keep the entire network healthy, which is why uh, Matt and the others have been working so hard to um, have the whole Main Street network included in the some of the recovery programs. And uh, it, I'm told that it's that the, that it's a very popular thing, and we can hopefully expect that there would be a significant chunk of money that will be invested in regeneration. Now, I'm also wanting to say there are, are emerging opportunities and Matt spoke a little of this earlier. Um, communities that have a, a lot of amenities that are near recreation, national parks, things like that, water, uh, sea, uh, seacoast towns, and all of that. Uh, the ones that have amenities and that are have broadband internet access are in a great position to benefit from People who, who now that they, the, the ones that are fortunate enough to be able to work remotely are saying, it's really expensive living in Chicago or New York. I can have a much better quality of life in a place that's smaller, um, where I have more of a sense of community and I can remain connected. <clears throat> so it's brought up the, the issue of how important it is to have really uh, infrastructure that, that works. And that's number one in my book would be uh, broadband, definitely. Now, over the next, you probably are already doing some of this in your localities, is is beginning to kind of, if you don't have a map and inventory of the spaces and the, um, the occupancy of your downtown buildings, it's a good time to start accumulating it so that you're well equipped for uh, beginning to work with, exist, to continue to work with existing merchants, but to also, as Matt was saying, continue to try to nurture entrepreneurs locally to open businesses uh, somewhere downtown as well. It's also a good time, as Kennedy Smith would tell you, that property values are down and it might be a good time for local governments if uh, they have the, the wherewithal to actually acquire some of the vacant properties uh, and be able to then play more, of, have a bigger hand in guiding their fate. Um, maybe subdividing a large department store for um, smaller businesses and things like that. I think one of the things that's really important to remember is that um, Main Street is neither a blue thing nor a red thing. There are Main Street programs in blue states, in red states, and in states that alternate back and forth periodically. And that I think is because Main Street is something that is in people's hearts. It's the center of most communities, particularly the smaller communities. And that means that it's, it's got, it pulls at a heartstring that's more than just about economics and more than, than, than just about preservation. It really has a lot of the coherent things that we need to pull our lives back together again after this. Uh, as Matt spoke of equity and all of the other issues that come together, it's a place that connects us all. 
is another book that came out uh, just a, a little bit before mine did. And I'm going to pull it out and plug somebody else's book too. Mindy Thompson, Full of Love, has written one. I love the subtitle on it. Uh, it's How a City's Heart Connects Us All. She's a sociologist and has looked at it from that perspective. And it really struck me, it is its heart. And that's one of the reasons that it wouldn't go away. It wouldn't go away when we were about to, to end it three years uh, after we started it. And it hasn't gone away. And I don't think it's going to go again. However, I'm going to say, every one of you out there, uh, you are playing an incredible role in it. And you're going to keep it going. But I'm also encouraging you, self-care. You cannot do this 24-7. It is going to kill you to try to do that. You need to be looking at how you care for yourself, how you get others to work with you, and how you get the entire community involved in Main Street, Main Street's coming back. Not just your committees and not just your boards and not just yourself. It's reaching out and saying to the whole community, hey, this is yours. This is more than the merchants and this is more than the economics of it. We have to keep this going and we need your help to come back on board and help us do that. And from my estimation, over the last 40 years, they're gonna be there and work with you on it. So that's all I had planned to say. Um, I hope you've been really good at imagining pictures. And I again, apologize for the tech glitches, um, but that's the best we could do today. So I really wanna thank those of you who are still tuned in um, for staying with it. I'm gonna be back when you take your lunch break and I'm gonna, and get in conversation with you. And it's the part I've been looking forward to the whole time. So uh, when you when time comes, go get your lunch and come back and let's let's munch and talk together. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mary, so much. Um, I did wanna let you know you're getting lots of love and support in the chat, um, both in support of your Zoom technical difficulties, which we've all experienced over the last year and the fact that you had a plan C Good for you. Um, and also somebody said that you delivered one of the most coherent, informative presentations they've heard in 70 years and that your confidence, humility, and clarity of overview were great contributions and that she was grateful to be present and educated by you. So I think that's a pretty amazing compliment. Slides or no slides, right? Well, well thank you. I'm going to clip that and <laughs> use it. As, somebody should send that as an Amazon review. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh thank yeah, you. You that's right, great idea. Um, All right. And let me introduce myself really quick. My name is Amy Barnhart. I'm a revitalization specialist with New Mexico Main Street. And I'll actually be moderating Mary's Q&A at lunchtime today. So as Mary said, please come back and join us then for that. I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and Mary, I did wanna mention too, if you wanted to, I'm sure people would still love to see some of the pictures that you had in your presentation. So if you, I know you've been in contact with my colleague, Will Powell. Yeah. So maybe you could just email him the PDF and then he'll I send will. it to me and I can share it during your Q&A. You can just let me know which one uh, you want to be shown. I'm going to suggest that we not try to do that today because I've got three different computers and none of them are doing the right thing to be able to do that. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy time, so. But I will. I will. So send maybe to, we could share them, um, share the slides with people after the fact. Oh, I'll, I'll email something to to uh, William shortly after. Okay, and I will come Wonderful. back and see you guys at lunchtime. Thank you so much, Mary. We truly appreciate you. you um, and everybody else. Oh, thank you. Um, we have a a short break before our next um, presenter, Janet Berkey, at at ten. So. Um, Take a second to go stretch your legs, grab some water, and we'll see you back in just a few minutes. 